Nigeria has for the last decade been battling insurgency in the northeast and more recently other forms of terrorism in the northwestern part of the country. This has led to the displacement of thousands of people across the country taking shelter in various camps. But the daunting task of providing relief and other humanitarian support for the victims of conflict as well as the rise in social vices in the camps is overwhelming the efforts of government and humanitarian organizations. Only recently, a girl in one of the communities reportedly committed suicide after she was raped by an aid worker. According to the Director General of the Borno State Emergency Management Agency, Hajia Yabawa Kolo, in 2021, over 600 cases of sexual and gender-based violence involving mostly teenage girls were recorded in the camp. The Borno State government, following its decision to resettle communities displaced by the conflict, has resettled seven out of the 13 officially internally displaced persons camps within the Meduguri metropolis. Now, over 115,000 households, making a total of 699,000 IDPs, have been resettled with a 150,000 Naira initial welfare support. However, the resettlement of the IDPs is being received with mixed reactions in the different quarters. During his last visits to Nigeria, the Vice President of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Girls Gabone, observed that some families willing to go back to their homes fear for their safety and lack of access to basic services. What are the concerns around the safe return of internally displaced persons? This will be our issue in focus today on the program. I am Ayubay Lea. Thank you for joining. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at this report. Since the beginning of insurgency in Burno State, many have been displaced by terrorist attacks in communities in the last 12 years. The state government had earlier hinted its plans to shut down all IDP camps. It said that the decision was informed by the recent improved security situation and also to stop over dependence on humanitarian support. At the moment, six IDP camps out of 13 have been closed and resettled back to their ancestral homes. Some IDPs have expressed fears that the insecurity still persists in their community, but others want government assistance before relocating. Honestly, going back home empty-handed is a problem. But when we have something to rely on, it will be easy. We want the governor to support us financially so we can go home and do business. We heard that even those who return left their community because they were attacked. We are also afraid, but home is better than here. And even the assistance we get from NGOs has reduced compared to before. It seems they are also tired. I'm from Mongunu local government. Going back there, where are we going to farm? All the villages around my Mongunu have arrested the farmlands. When the season has already passed, then we should farm? It won't work. We want the government to allow us to continue to stay here. If the government wants us to return, so hunger should kill us, we will go. Food items are very costly in the market. There are 28 IDP camps in Borno State. So far, more than 90,000 IDPs have been resettled in their communities. We close Mogolis, post Mogolis, followed by NYC, uh, followed by Bakasi, uh, also close uh, Haruna Halana, Munada T, and Farm Center. These are the ones that we have already officially closed. 
then two is almost the deadline is like two days remaining, especially for teachers' village and stadium camp. But insha Allah, if not hundred percent, we will guarantee you eighty percent closure. As the government continues its resettlement of displaced persons, many hope that the new year will be an end to insurgency in Borno State. All right, to get perspective on this, I have in the studio Ambassador Ahmed Shehu, who is the chairman, Northeast Civil Society Network. Thank you and welcome uh, to the program. Thank you, Ayuba. It's good to have you. Now, uh, let's talk about this resettlement you know, program by the Borno State Government. Are we ripe for that now? Yeah, uh, it depends on the perspective and circumstances one view uh, the whole situation, considering starting from the point of uh, the actual conflict itself, 13 years now, and we are still counting. Uh, international uh, organization, donors, everybody considered the Northeast as a spotlight and massive support were provided. And suddenly after 13 years, like everybody is getting a bomb, everybody is getting like a, a concern about for how long is this going to continue. So if you find yourself in this kind of a situation, you'll find people coming up with different models to exhibit to see which way can be able to give us the solution to this. Let's not forget that 70% uh, of the population of the North is their profession is farming. And with this development, with this insurgency, it, it comes with a lot of implication. One of the implications, people can no longer go to farm and then harvest their crop and then which they use throughout the year for them to consume. And you see, if you, lose, if you lose a means of livelihood, the implications are many. You will be vulnerable. If it is a young girl, she will be vulnerable for, to engage in a lot of things, sex for food. If I, you have the younger, the younger people being recruited by the ISWAP and others, the, the issue is so complicated. But now with the advent of this uh, uh, governor, Governor Zulem, who happened to be also be a commissioner for reconstruction and uh, rehabilitation for over uh, uh, six years, he understood the situation. And now he said, okay, let's put this uh, model to test. And so this is how uh, it started. To answer your question, as a civil society, we are, I'm a proponent of like a collective uh, responsibility because everybody is involved in this situation <clears throat> and everybody like uh, have brought uh, 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 support concern the federal government of Nigeria the UN INGO the civil society everyone is involved in this so whatever we are trying to do is like collectively coming together to design the processes and to succeed on this there are a lot of uh, documents I want to reply you to for instance, let me start with the, the global trend. There is this Kampala Convention that uh, Nigeria is a signatory to it. And that Kampala Convention has, uh, especially Section 1 to 5, has mentioned, discussed about the, the duty of the state to protect its own citizens, especially the right and then uh, safety of the internet displaced people. Nigeria is a signatory. By implication, mean you need to like, be guided by this document. That is one. Then if you come locally, <clears throat> I think four years ago, uh, because of this concern, the UN, the government and the civil society, we came together, we developed a document that is called Bonos Territory Strategy. And that document, uh, then the then UN Secretary General, UN uh, Head of Office in Nigeria, the National Humanitarian Coordinator for Nigeria, who just left some month ago, Edwin Callot, signed on behalf of the United Nations. The present uh, governor signed on behalf of Bonos State Government. Then I sign on behalf of the civil society. That document encompasses every uh, local and international protocol that need to be observed in order to ensure that we have the best practices, meaning it starts from bottom to top with consultation. What does the Kampala Convention say? It? The Kampala Convention say it, for you to return an internet displaced person or a refugee to his original place of abode, you need to observe these three conditions. One, all return must be voluntary, meaning 
you as an Ayuba, if you are displaced and you want to go back to, for instance, let me give you uh, <laughs> Damasak, for instance, your community. When you want to go back to Damasak, while you are resident in Maiduguri, the uh, international best practice is you will be to convey to Damasak to go and look at the situation in Damasak. How is Damasak now compared to when you left Damasak? Mm -hmm. How are your homes when you were originally there and now? Then after this, they will return you back to Maiduguri. After then they will ask you, Ayuba, are you ready to go back to Damasak? It means you are now taking this decision voluntarily without any influence or without anybody uh, making you to uh, influence in that decision. That is one. Then all return must be in safety and dignity. Safety means when on the process of return, during the return, and while you are at stay, is that particular place safe? This is also a factor that we really need to consider. Then despite this also, a dignity also come into it. Meaning when you are being taken there, the necessary support that are required, the necessary respect that will ensure your dignity need to be also employed. Meaning you are not uh, being conveyed under inhuman situation. This, this is what the convention is saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to mention that this convention has been in existence for over, almost getting to two decades now. Meaning it is not like tailored to suit certain Okay, so are we observing, aspects. so are we observing, you know, with the program that you, with your experience on ground, yes. are we observing, you know, these conventions? you know, as they should be observed? Yeah, I can say uh, yes and then no. Yes, in the fact that uh, the necessary consultation have started and uh, it just happened abruptly. So meaning there are no time for this kind, for these stages to be employed. So what I'm trying to say here is we are a bit uh, haste in the process and we really need to like uh, involve everyone to in order for us to ensure that this happens meaning the issue of safety. And at times here, uh, without peer of contradiction, I don't want to like push a blame to certain aspect because the system in the North is you have several people taking decision that has implication on the life of the IDPs. For instance, the governor is the chief security officer, had decision on some aspect. Now there are improvements on the security. There is cordial relationship between the security and then the government institutions. But before you see the, the security agencies will take decision on their own. So meaning, as a governor, if I want my people to go back, I can say, okay, I want them to go back as a chief security, but it's not compulsory on the, chief, uh, on the security agencies to, to support. To supply. So mm -hmm. you see, there are things that sometimes is uh, based on your decision, you can be able to influence, and there are things that based on the constitution of Nigeria, you don't have the right to influence on that. So generally, to answer your question is, there is, uh, for me, I think we can do better by bringing everybody's voice on board to ensure that, for instance, let me give you an example with the international organizations. They are here in, Borno, in the Northeast to support the government. They are there, they have a full of fund and support to provide. What, uh, what we are expecting from civil society is everyone should be called on board. Let's have a timeline, let, let's have a road map. The return should be gradual. Everybody, Ayuba organization, ABC, this is where we are going. Okay. All right. Now, I mean, one of the concerns expressed by some of these IDPs is the fact that, you know, they are returning to their communities, but, I mean, they are not even sure of what they are returning to. These communities have been, you know, devastated and they have been degraded, you know, by this uh, bandit. So, uh, in terms of access to health care, for instance, and other basic amenities, you know, what's the, what is there for them and what is the assurance that they will not be displaced any further? Well, for this, I think there are no assurance about that because these are, this, these are some of those major concerns that we mentioned that the, uh, the Kampala Convention is trying to address. And I brought you back to Borno State Return Strategy. That document spells all the processes. And I'm happy to mention to you that now we have brought the issue to the government and, and partners. Right now, the document is under review again so that to accommodate the emerging situation of what is happening. And despite that, after that 13 years of this insurgency, it's very difficult for we able to tell you that, yes, they will just go and then find their uh, communities in El Dorado like Hollywood movie. No, definitely they have to, everyone have to pick up their pieces of their life. And then with this, that's why we are advocating that there's supposed to be a holistic and coordinated approach where every stakeholder will come on board. And this year, I think the federal government can do better, have a, role to, a, role of, uh, a lot of role to play. 
Borno State alone and then the government of Borno State and international partners cannot be able to do this by themselves. What the international partners are doing is to complement the effort of the government. Today, if the government is so interested, they can, okay, leave our country, they will leave. But what happened? Can you imagine a situation where all these donor agencies and international organizations with civil society are not on ground? What will happen? What picture are you going to have on that? So for me, I think we can, uh, there's a lot of uh, strategic engagement that we really need to do to sit down on the drawing board and then cut a clear picture of a long time, a short time, long time, and a sustainable process of uh, resettlement. Okay. All right. Well, well, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, the discussion will continue on the program. Please stay with us. The insurgency has triggered acute humanitarian and post-displacement crisis with devastated, devastating social and economic impact on the population, further deepening fragility and poverty in the Northeast sub-region. The outcome of the recovery and peace building assessment by the World Bank, EU and UN revealed that the total sum of about 6.9 billion US dollars was lost as a result of the insurgency in the entire Northeastern state. Out of this, Borno State accounts for over two third percent. The insurgency, the insurgents have, just, have, just, have destroyed about 5,000 classrooms in Borno State. About 800 municipal buildings were destroyed, comprising of local government secretariat, prisons, traditional rulers' buildings, among others. They destroyed about 713 energy distribution lines. Furthermore, they destroyed about 1,600 water sources. In addition to this one, we have a total number of about 49,311 widows and about 49,917 orphans. These are official figures. The unofficial figures are more than this. You are, we have seen in Borno State, the incidences of bomb attacks has been reduced drastically. Yes. For how long? Before then, on a daily basis, we have been witnessing bombings throughout Borno State. But this has been reduced by about 80%, if not more than 90%. Restruction, reconstruction of lives and livelihoods embarked upon the relentlessly over 5,000 physical infrastructure built by the state and federal government. Partnership with international community helped to strengthen government efforts. We partner with international organizations. Yes, sometimes we differ in our own understandings, but most importantly, the UN OCHA, the UN agencies, and some international organizations and local organizations have given great support to the government of Borno State because we have what we call uh, a return strategy. High-level steering committee meeting headed by the deputy governor. Membership cut across different strata. we were able, the UN system, UNHCR of course is in the lead on such matters, to pre-position people, stocks, camps, you know, tents, etc., to receive people back, it is the crucial element of voluntary return. And it's no different in northeast Nigeria as, as it is in Afghanistan or Ethiopia. We actually get a chance together, internationally and nationally, to make this an insurgency that we might be able to end. And that would be quite a fine thing these days. It won't end tomorrow, of course not, and it may get worse. But I think we can pull the elements together, do what we do best, others do what they do best, and make this a place of memory of the appalling acts as opposed to continuing trauma. In every case, if there isn't a, 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 the beginning of a possible basis for a meeting of minds, you're wasting your time. And if you're wasting your time, you're better off doing something, doing something different. And I think that doing something different is not just military victory, because that won't, won't work. It's community victory in the case of Northeast Nigeria. That will work. And I think it would be incredibly interesting 
for organizations of the kind you mentioned to be able to work with the government to help them on that approach. So you empower those restless, traumatized people to be the drivers of peace in the Northeast. And you could make it work. I really believe you could. All right, thank you for staying with us. You're watching Issues, and uh, here we have in the studio uh, Ambassador Ahmed Shehu, Chairman, Northeast Civil Society Network, talking to us about some of the engagement uh, with, with the uh, internally displaced persons in the Northeast, especially with respect to the resettlement uh, of some of those people uh, displaced by conflict. Now, uh, let's talk about implementation. I mean, it's one thing to have a document. You said that you, you were part of you know, a document that were drafted, that was drafted to guide the uh, resettlement of you know, these IDPs. But in terms of implementing what has been put out you know, in that document, uh, what kind of you know, collaboration are we seeing in practical terms? Well, as I mentioned, the document is uh, currently in the process of review, and some of the camps were already closed, and some of the partners are not, uh, they are caught uh, unaware about this closure, though the government has already informed that is, uh, they, they, will ha uh, they are in the process of closing the camp before the end of uh, last year and 2021. So precisely the document uh, is not being like for now put into practice as in uh, practically like that but i think there are some local engagement that is happening on that but what i'm trying to say here even the international uh, organizations some of them are not helping uh, matters because one thing that prostrated the citizens of Borno State and even the government to ensure that and to encourage this closure of camp is after all these years after injecting billions of uh, dollars we are still like uh, in the, in the same exactly, cycle. which which is a which is a basic concern, really. Exactly. I mean, if you if you if you look at, there were people who went to those IDP camps as singles. Now they are married exactly. in the IDP camps. Uh, they went there without having any child. Now they have children. Exactly. So it's like, I mean, you have a community of people that will continually be fed, exactly. literally, by government. And how sustainable is that? Yeah, that is the concern. That is the sympathy the governor is having from the citizens because, like. Uh, He's a, a, a kind of a proponent of someone who, no, this is not our real people. This is not our culture and this is not our tradition. Begging, living on aid and survival, and you considering that the donor fatigue is now coming in, even the support that is coming into the north is now, is now been, uh, the attention focus is now on Northwest and other countries that are experiencing. So he knows that it's not sustainable to continue keeping these people for a very long time and continue feeding. I mentioned that in you know, my other discussion, the discussion we had with the governor when we were engaging about the closure of the camp, what he mentioned was he has a, a valid report of an IDP who has married three different women. One of the women is living in Lagos, the other one in camp in Maiduguri, and then the other one in the host community. And when this man, uh, uh, this thing's financial status was like scrutinized, he, like, he has like over five million naira in his account. Meaning, if you have this kind of an luxury and you are still living in IDP camp, what do you call this? And he also narrated about going to a camp in the wee hours of the night, while when we went to, conduct some roll calls, majority of the IDFs are not there. People sleep in the host community and then come to the camp in order to... What I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to justify the sudden, then abrupt closure of the camp, but what I'm trying to say is, let's look at critically, look at the context and understood, understand the situation. Is it the way we want to be? How do we want to have the change that we want to see? So I think he was so, let me use the word, prostrated about this thing not ending and other people are not doing the right thing that they're supposed to do. Let me take the bull by the horn and then let's go on that. All right. Now, in, by way of rounding up, uh, what are your expectations, you know, uh, with respect to these resettlement? What do you look forward to seeing, you know, in the coming uh, days? Okay, thank you for the question. One thing we are always advocating for as a civil society is a, a very coordinated uh, approach to the situation where every stakeholder will sit, just as the governor observed. He has a basket that anyone who would want to put in the support can come 
and then the support should channel to the people. I think this is one way of encouraging transparency and accountability to the affected population. So I'm calling on all stakeholders. We can't achieve this alone. I think coordinated approach is very important. Then we should ensure that uh, we provide access to the humanitarian workers and then the civil society. Of course, whenever they go back to any communities, they need people to go and provide this support to them. And for you to do that, there has to be an access and there has to be a security for humanitarian aid workers to go there. Then for international communities, what I want to employ again is for them to honor their commitment on localization. 13 years after, and you are complaining about access, what happened to your relationship with the civil society that are on the ground? Had it been the bill our capacity to a label where we can now be able to seamlessly provide support, do what they are trying to do, it will really go a long way. Like, for instance, partnering with local civil society. You get a donor, for instance, if it is a 50 million from a donor, you are giving me 10 million to go and provide that support, while the other money being uh, speculated is going on logistical aspect. Build the capacity of the local community so that they can be able to, on their own, handle their problems on that uh, aspect. Then generally, I mentioned about livelihood. 70% are farmers, they cannot be able to sustain themselves unless you make the environment secure. Taking them to communities is fine. Then when they go back to the community, how do they survive? They need a means of livelihood. What is the means of livelihood? Farming. Who is going to control that? It's only the security for them to go and then take themselves back. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for availing your time and coming on the program and sharing your perspective. The pleasure us. is mine. Everybody. We appreciate you. Thank now, you. we've been speaking with Ambassador Ahmed Shehu. He is the chairman, Northeast Civil Society uh, Network, talking, Network, talking to us about the resettlement of IDPs uh, in the Northeast, specifically in Borno State. Well, with that, we've come to the end of the program. Uh, in case you missed, you can always catch up on our YouTube. And also, don't forget, you can connect with us via our social media platforms. My name is Ayubaila. Thank you for watching, and bye for now.